Okay, in this next video, um, I'm going to be talking specifically about the difference between deductive arguments on the one hand and inductive arguments on the other. Now, um, the main reason why it is important to be able to tell the difference between um, these two kinds of arguments, and then there's a third kind of reasoning, kind of, it's kind of closer to induction, but it's known as abductive reasoning. We'll be getting into that later. Um, but the reason why it's important to tell the difference between these different kinds of arguments um, is because they're designed to do different things. So if I present one kind of argument, you know, let's say I give you an inductive argument and you interpret my argument deductively, you think I'm actually trying to give a deductive argument, um, you're actually using too high of a standard. Um, I'm trying to do this much, really, and you're interpreting my argument as if I'm kind of trying to do more. I'm trying to do that much. So if you use the wrong standards to analyze and evaluate my argument, you're going to have the wrong idea. You're, you're going to be using too strict um, evidential or logical standards. Okay, so here's the major difference. Um, when we're using deduction, what we are trying to do is guarantee that the conclusion is true on the basis of true premises. So deductive arguments are intended to provide logically conclusive support for the conclusion. So that's why with deductive arguments, we say that the conclusion is implied by the premises, necessitated by the premises, so on and so forth. So with, with deductive inferences, you get this really strong tie uh, between the premises and the conclusion, where with a good deductive argument, if the premises are true, the conclusion will be guaranteed. So with a deductive argument, the whole idea is that truth is supposed to guarantee truth. Truth is supposed to guarantee truth, okay? Now, with an inductive argument, on the other hand, we're not trying to give logically conclusive support on the basis of the premises. With induction, all we're trying to show is that on the basis of true premises, the conclusion is more likely than not. So you can't guarantee the truth of a conclusion using an inductive argument. Um, with inductive arguments, all you can do is show that a conclusion is much more likely to be true on the basis of the premises than without the premises. Um, there are forms of you know, formal induction which use formal probability and things like that, but uh, no inductive argument can actually guarantee that the conclusion is true on the basis of true premises. Okay. Now, so the technical terminology that we use here um, is as follows. So what I'm talking about here is what's known as classical validity. Um, don't worry about the distinction between classical validity and non-classical validity. Um, there are non-classical systems of logic that have a stricter uh, notion of validity than what we're talking about here. So for example, um, in rel what's called relevance logic, um, it's not enough for the truth of the conclusion to be guaranteed on the basis of the premises. Um, the conclusion actually has to be relevant to the premises. So that's beyond what we're going to be getting in, in into in this class. So, But just bear in mind what I'm talking about here is just what we would call classical formal deduction or classical formal validity. Okay, so to say that a conclusion is classically valid means if the premises are true, uh, the conclusion will be guaranteed. I realize that I screwed up this sentence, but I don't care. So a deductive argument is classically valid if true premises will guarantee a true conclusion. Okay, or more formally, to say that a deductive argument is classically valid means it is not possible to derive a false conclusion from true premises. It's not possible to derive a false conclusion from true premises. Okay? Now, with invalidity, this is not the case. So a deductive argument is classically invalid um, if true premises do not guarantee a true conclusion. So with an invalid argument, even if you know that the premises are true, that is not enough to guarantee that the conclusion 
is true. Now, the reason why this is a problem is because that is how deduction is supposed to work. Remember, so with deduction, truth is supposed to guarantee truth. So if you have a deductive argument where truth does not guarantee truth, that obviously means that you've got a flawed argument, since that's what deductive arguments are designed to do. Or once again, more technically, um, a deductive argument is classically invalid if it is possible to derive a false conclusion from true premises. So with deductive arguments that are invalid, even if you have true premises, the conclusion can still be false, which is an indication that there's something deeply wrong with the argument, okay? Now, so let me give you an example here in a moment. Now, this is probably one of the trickiest things to grasp about this concept of validity and invalidity. So, you know, if, if it's not abundantly clear at first, don't worry about it. Because even when I teach logic, um, you know, full-blown mathematical and symbolic logic courses, you know, we'll be 10 weeks into the semester and a student will say, Professor Parsons, can you can you explain again the difference between validity and invalidity? So it's it's kind of a hard concept to grasp. And that is this. Whether or not an argument is valid or invalid has nothing to do in a classical sense. Uh, whether or not an argument is classically valid or classically invalid has nothing to do with the actual content of the argument. It has nothing to do with the subject matter. It has nothing to do with whether the premises are actually true or actually false. Uh, classical validity and classical invalidity are solely determined by the what we call the form of the argument or the actual pattern of the argument. So every deductive argument is going to fall into pretty strict mathematical patterns. Um, that is why, for example, we can take uh, English arguments and translate them symbolically in a, in a purely mathematical grammar and apply mathematical rules to see if the arguments are valid or invalid. Um, so with deduction, if you just memorize the valid patterns and then some of the common invalid patterns, you can just look at an argument um, without having to test it and say, no, that's valid, no, that's invalid, okay? So it has nothing to do with whether the premises of the argument are actually true or actually false. It has everything to do with the pattern of the argument, okay? So here is an example. So take this argument. All beers are beverages, all Guinnesses are beverages, therefore all Guinnesses are beers. So all beers are beverages, all Guinnesses, if you don't know what Guinness is, Guinness is a nitrogen-infused Irish stout with rich chocolate and coffee notes, and it's uh, one of the only things my people contributed uh, to the world. Well, that and the cranberries and Liam Neeson and whiskey, all that stuff. Yeah, I guess all that stuff is pretty good too. So all beers are beverages, all Guinnesses are beverages, therefore all Guinnesses are beers, all right? So is this valid or invalid? Well, uh, we've got true premises, so it is true that all beers are beverages, it's true that all Guinnesses are beverages, and it's also true that all Guinnesses are beers. So we have true premises and a true conclusion. So you might think it's valid, because the premises are true and the conclusion is actually true, but that would be a mistake. So keep in mind the definition of classical validity. An argument is classically valid if it's not possible to derive a false conclusion from true premises. So whether or not this argument is valid or invalid is solely a matter, classically speaking, of whether or not using this pattern of argument you can get true premises false conclusion. So even though with this example, even though with this example, the premises are actually true and the conclusion is actually true, what matters is whether or not using this pattern would allow us to have true premises false conclusion. So it would be a mistake to say that this argument is valid simply in virtue of the fact that the premises and the conclusion are actually true. That's not what determines whether the argument is classically valid or classically invalid. It's the pattern, it's the form, 
Okay, so this is the actual pattern of this argument. All right. So all P are M. So all beers are beverages. So beers is P, beverages is M. All Guinnesses are beverages. All S are M. So Guinnesses is S and beverages is M. Therefore, all S are P. All Guinnesses are beers. So all beers are beverages, all P are M. All Guinnesses are beverages, all S are M. Therefore, all Guinnesses are beers, all S are P. All right. So let me go back. So all beers, P, are beverages, M. All Guinnesses, S, are beverages, M. Therefore, all Guinnesses, S, are beers, P. Okay, so that's the actual structure or pattern or form of the argument. Okay, now just by looking at the pattern or the form, can you tell whether it's valid or invalid? Can you, just by looking at it, say, yeah, we could get a false conclusion from true premises using this pattern of argument? So writing it out this way might make it a little clearer, but for most people, I would say probably not. Okay, so here's what we can actually do. Um, using this pattern, we can actually construct what's known as a counter example. And uh, the counter example method is one of the first methods you use in an introduction to logic class to prove that arguments are invalid. Um, and what you do is this. So once you find the pattern of the argument or the form of the argument, in this case, it's what's known as a categorical syllogism, a categorical argument, um, you can actually replace the, the variables, in this case, S, M, and P, you can actually replace the variables which stand for terms with new terms, usually ones that can be easily categorized, things like cat, dog, mammal, animal, um, living thing, things like that. Okay, now, and if you replace the variables with new terms that can be easily categorized and you get true premises false conclusion, that is enough to show that this argument pattern is invalid. Okay, so here's, an, here's a counterexample of this pattern, all right? So all cats are animals, all P are M, all dogs are animals, all S are M, therefore all dogs are cats, all S are P. So all cats are animals, all P are M, all dogs are animals, all, all S are M. Therefore, all dogs are cats. All S are P. Okay? Now, so this argument has true premises and a false conclusion, right? So it's this pattern, but it's the same pattern as our original argument, which is talking about beers and beverages and Guinnesses. Okay? So this is really important. Even though these two arguments, this one talking about cats and animals and dogs, is talking about different things than this argument, which is talking about beers and beverages and Guinnesses, they are both this pattern. So this argument with true premises false conclusion is this pattern. And this argument with true premises, true conclusion is this pattern. But the fact that we can come up with an example using that pattern where we have true premises and a false conclusion, that is enough to show that this pattern is invalid. So this is an invalid pattern. Now, but since both of these arguments use this pattern, our original argument is invalid. True premises do not guarantee a true conclusion. And this argument is likewise invalid. True premises do not guarantee a true conclusion. So the fact that they're talking about different things is irrelevant. So what that means is anytime you see an argument that uses this pattern, anytime you see an argument that uses this pattern, you know it is invalid automatically. 
So you can replace S, M, and P. You can replace those variables with any terms that you want. You can do that an infinite number of times. That argument is still going to be invalid. It's the form or the pattern which determines whether or not it's valid or invalid, not the content, okay? So again, I know that's a difficult concept, but if you need to, you know, rewind this a few times and watch that section over again, feel free to, okay? Now, but as far as deductive arguments go, though, we are concerned with validity. The other thing we are concerned for is whether or not the argument is sound, all right? So there are three categories that deductive arguments can fall into, and these are what they are, okay? So if you have a deductive argument that is valid and sound, that means that the form or the pattern guarantees a true conclusion. It has that truth guaranteeing kind of pattern to it, and all of the premises are actually true. So if you have an argument that's valid and sound, that means the conclusion is guaranteed to be true. So you would be contradicting yourself if you say, well, the argument's valid and sound, but the conclusion is false. Uh, that's not possible. It's not possible to have an argument pattern that guarantees a true conclusion uh, on the basis of true premises. All of the premises are true and the conclusion is false. That is logically impossible, all right? Now, you could also have an argument that's valid and unsound. So if the argument's valid and unsound, that means that, once again, the form guarantees a true conclusion. It has a truth guaranteeing pattern, but at least one of the premises is false. Now, if you have a valid and unsound argument, sometimes with a false premise, you will have a false conclusion. Other times you will have a true conclusion. So with a valid unsound argument, it doesn't guarantee a true conclusion. It also doesn't guarantee a false conclusion. Okay. Now, and if you have an invalid and unsound argument, it means that the form does not guarantee, or gone t, I guess I said here, uh, a true conclusion. Okay, so all invalid arguments are unsound, regardless of whether or not the premises are actually true. Okay, so the argument of all beers are beverages, all Guinnesses are beverages, therefore all Guinnesses are beers, it has true premises, true conclusion, yet it's still invalid and unsound. So if you have an invalid pattern with all true premises, it's unsound. If you have an invalid pattern with uh, at least one false premise, it's still unsound either way. So all invalid arguments are automatically unsound, all right? Okay, now with induction, um, we don't use the language of validity and soundness when we're talking about um, inductive arguments. We use the language of what's called strength and cogency, okay? Oh, before I get to that, let me give you a couple of deductive patterns. I don't even remember the order. All right, so one valid deductive pattern, which we're going to be seeing a lot of this uh, in this course, is known as modus ponens. And modus ponens is a conditional kind of argument. It uses uh, conditional statements or hypothetical statements. And here is the pattern. So if P is true, then so is Q, where P and Q are any statements or propositions whatsoever. So if P is true, then so is Q. Well, P is true, therefore Q is also true. So if P is true, then so is Q. P is true, therefore Q is true. So this is a valid pattern, meaning anytime those, true, uh, those two premises are true, the conclusion will be guaranteed. Right, And then we also have modus tollens, again, another common pattern of argument, which we're going to be seeing a lot of. And modus tollens is if P is true, then so is Q. Well, Q is false, therefore P is false. So if P is true, then so is Q. Q is false, therefore P is also false. Right? So like modus ponens, this is also a classically valid pattern of argument. So with this pattern of argument, anytime the premises are true, the conclusion is going to be true as well. Okay, now we're ready to talk about induction and strength and cogency. Okay, so inductive arguments are either strong or weak, and they are either cogent or uncogent. All right, so to say that an inductive argument is strong means that the conclusion is made more likely on the assumption that the premises are true. 
And man, there's a lot of spelling errors in here, but yeah, this isn't a spelling class. All right, so to say that an inductive argument is strong means that the conclusion is made more likely on the assumption of true premises, all right? Now, an inductive argument is weak if the conclusion is not made more likely on the assumption that the premises are true, okay? So the whole idea here is that the truth of the premises needs to actually make a difference to the truth of the conclusion. So um, I know um, in one of the textbooks, um, it says something like, well, an inductive argument is strong if the conclusion has a probability of over 50% of being true. No, that's that's not the case at all. Um, that's actually a, a kind of a sloppy definition of inductive strength. Um, here's an example why. Okay, so for example, suppose we have a conclusion C which has a prior probability of 50%. So independently of any reasons in favor of C or against C, it's just got a prior probability of 50% of uh, likelihood that it's true. All right, so the chance of this uh, claim C being true is 50%, and it, the chance is 50% independently of any reasons in favor of it or against it, okay? So for example, um, an example of this as far as abstract probability would be is C, C would be, you know, your, your chance of getting ahead if you flip a standard coin. Well, it's you've got a 50% chance of getting ahead. So the claim I will get ahead with this uh, coin flip, the, the chance that that claim is too, true just in an abstract sense is 50%. Okay, so the prior probability of some conclusion is 50%. And let's say that on the assumption that the premises one and two are true, the probability of C is now increased to 51%. So the prior probability of C is 50%, but now that we've thrown in some true premises, we've increased the chance that C is true to 51%. Now, but what that means is that this new evidence or these new reasons in favor of C only increase the likelihood that it's true by 1%. That's not a strong argument. So obviously, if the prior probability of your conclusion being true is already 50, and the reasons you give in favor of that conclusion in an argument only increase the likelihood that the conclusion is true by one measly percentage point, that's really not that compelling of an argument. Why? Because there was already a 50% chance that the conclusion was true anyways, okay? All right, so that is why we mean that when it comes to inductive strength, the premises need to actually work in increasing the chance that the conclusion is true or the probability that the uh, that the conclusion is true or the likelihood. So not all inductive arguments are based on likelihoods. They're not all based on probabilities, but there is a difference between likelihood and probability, which I'm not going to get into. Okay, now, um, as far as the three categories go, um, if an inductive argument is strong and cogent, that means that the conclusion is made more likely and the premises are actually true, which means that if it's a good, you know, that means that you've got a pretty good shot that the conclusion is true. All right. It could be strong and uncogent. I can't talk. Meaning the conclusion is made more likely, but at least one premise is false. And it could also be weak and uncogent, meaning that the conclusion is not made more likely on the assumption of true premises. Um, and whether or not the premises are actually true at this point does not matter. So if you have a weak argument, whether or not you have actually true premises or actually false premises doesn't matter because the premises don't actually work in uh, supporting the conclusion that you actually have, okay? All right, so uh, this brief description of deduction and induction will suffice for now. And uh, as always, if you have any questions on this, do not hesitate to email me, and I'll see you all next time.